two particles, A and B, have masses of 2m and m, respectively. The particles are attached to the ends of a light and extensible string. Particle A is held at rest on a fixed rough horizontal table, so there is friction, at a distance of d from the small smooth light pulley, which is fixed at the edge of the table at point P. The coefficient of friction between A and the table is mu, where mu is less than a half. The string is parallel to the table from A to P and passes over the pulley. Particle B hangs freely at rest vertically below P, with a string taut and at a height of h, where h is less than d, above a horizontal floor as shown in figure 3. Particle A is then released from rest with a string taut and slides along the table. Find an equation of motion for A and for B. Okay, so to get equations of motion, we have to get force diagrams. So, B has a weight of mg, A has a weight of 2mg, there's tension forces of T and T on both objects. The reaction force upwards would also be 2mg, there's no other vertical forces. It's accelerating towards the right, object A that is, it's accelerating towards the right. So that means the resultant force is towards the right. Vertically there is no resultant force, so the reaction force will just equal to the weight. We also have a friction force towards the left, which is mu r. It's moving, so the frictional force will be equal to mu r. We don't know what mu is, but we do know what r is. r is equal to 2mg, so therefore the frictional force will be mu times the 2mg, which we can write as 2 mu mg. Again, that is just mu r. Okay, acceleration for B is downwards, and now we can get our equations of motion. So let's start with object A. We have a tension towards the right and the force of 2 mu mg towards the left. So the overall force towards the right would be T minus the 2 mu mg. That will be equal to ma. Mass of object A is 2m. Acceleration is A. Call that equation 1. And then for object B, we have the acceleration going downwards. So the resultant force must be downwards. mg minus T is the resultant downwards force. So mg minus t, that will equal to ma again. The mass of b is m, acceleration is a, that is equation 2. So those are our two equations of motion, that's part a done. For part b, we want to show that until b hits the floor, the acceleration of a is this. So the acceleration of a would be the same as the acceleration of b. This is an inextensible string, so... So long as there is tension in the string, the motion of B, the speed, the acceleration, will be the same as that of A. So we want to work out the acceleration. If we look at what's in the expression that we have over here, there's mu, we have g, there's no tension. So looking back at our equations, we want to get rid of tension. So if we add the two equations, so the t's will cancel, we have t and minus t these two become mg minus 2 mu mg. So mg minus 2 mu mg, and the right-hand side will be 3 ma. The m's cancel. g minus 2 mu g is equal to 3a. I'll bring the 3 to the right, so it becomes a third of g minus 2 mu g. That is our acceleration. And if we look at the form that we wanted to get it in, we want to factorize out that g. So acceleration is then equal to g over 3 times 1 minus 2 mu. And for part c, find in terms of g, h, and mu the speed of a at the instant when b hits the floor. Okay, so this is going to be a SUVAC question. Looking at our diagram, B travels a distance of h before it hits the floor, and therefore A will travel a distance of h as well in that time, as again, this is an inextensible string. Whatever B does downwards, A does towards the right. So for our SUVAC quantities, we know that the distance is going to be h, that's the distance that A travels. The initial velocity is zero, the whole thing starts from rest. The final velocity is what we're trying to work out, and the acceleration is what we worked out before. So that would be g over 3 times 1 minus 2 mu. Time, we don't know. We don't need it because we have 
three quantities already, we can therefore work out a fourth. You always need three quantities to work out a fourth SUVAT quantity. And the equation that links all of those together is v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. So v squared is equal to u squared is 0. We have then 2 times a times s, which is h. Tidy this up. So v is equal to the square root of, so I'll bring together the 2, the g over 3, and the h. So 2gh over 3 times 1 minus 2 mu, all square rooted, that would be the speed. That is in terms of g, h, and mu. For part d. After b hits the floor, a continues to slide along the table. Given that mu is a third, and that a comes to rest at p, find d in terms of h. Okay, so what's happening here? Looking at our diagram, b hits the floor, it travels a distance of h, and therefore a will travel a distance of h towards the right. Let's call that stage 1. So this is stage 1. After b hits the floor, there's no more tension in the string, so there's no more force pulling a towards the right, but it already has some speed. For this first stage here, when b moves a distance of h towards the ground, a moves a distance of h towards the right, we worked out the final speed to be this. So that would be the initial speed for stage two. Stage two being the remainder of the journey, which is that distance there, that would be d minus h. It'll be this full distance minus what we have here. So let's call that stage two. So a starts at rest, moves towards the right. It has in that first stage, this acceleration. At the end of that first stage, it has this speed here. Then B hits the floor. There's no more tension. There's no more force pulling it towards the right. Now there's only a backwards frictional force at this point here. But it has some momentum. Again, it has a speed of this to begin with for that second stage. So it'll continue to move all the way to the end. And at point P, it just comes to rest. It doesn't hit point P and then come to rest because of the collision but rather because of the distance that it's traveled and the backwards frictional force, that is what makes it come to rest. It stops moving at exactly point P. So let's write out the SUVAC quantities for this second stage. Okay, so for stage two, distance is D minus H. That is the distance for this second stage here. The initial speed, the initial speed for stage two is the final speed for stage one. So we mentioned this earlier, the speed reached at the end of stage one is the initial speed for stage two. That was what we had over here. So the initial speed is, writing that out again, 2gh over three times one minus two mu. Final speed is zero. It comes to rest at that point P. Acceleration, we don't know. It's not the same as before. It's not this acceleration that we had here. And the reason it's not the same acceleration is because the forces have changed. We no longer have this tension force acting towards the right. When B hits the ground, the string goes slack. There's no more tension force pulling A along. Now we just have this backwards force. So we have to work out our new acceleration. Again, we don't have time. So we can't use time instead for our SUVAC quantities. We'll need to work out what the acceleration is or rather deceleration. So looking back at our diagram, the only force that we have on A when it's at this point, horizontally at least, the only horizontal force we have at A at this point is the backwards frictional force. The vertical forces will still just cancel. So the backwards frictional force is the resultant force. So resultant force is two mu mg. So two mu mg, if that's the resultant force on A, that's equal to ma, the mass of object A is 2m, so mass of m times acceleration. The two m's cancel, we're left with A is equal to mu g. We're told that mu is a third in the question, so therefore acceleration would be a third g. But it's decelerating, so let's write that as minus a third 
g. It's slowing down, so we have to put a minus sign there. So again, we know that mu is a third, so we can put that into this equation here for the initial speed. So I'll just deal with what's on the inside of this square root here. So we have 2gh over 3 multiplied by 1 minus 2 mu, 1 minus 2 times a third. So this here is 2 thirds, 1 minus 2 thirds is a third, a third multiplied by this would be 2gh over 9. So I'll actually just rub this out. Our initial velocity for stage 2 would then be 2gh over 9. Now we can use SUVAP. Let's just remind ourselves of our goal. So we're trying to find d in terms of h. So if we get a SUVAP equation for what we have here, we can then rearrange the whole thing to make d the subject. So what relates those quantities is v squared is u squared plus 2as. v is 0. u squared is 2gh over 9. We then have the plus 2as. So plus 2 times minus a third g times s, which is d minus h. To make things a bit nicer, I will change the second part of this expression. So what we have over here, I'll absorb the minus sign here. So if I absorb the minus sign here, so times this by minus 1, this becomes h minus d. I'll also bring the 2 up there. So plus 2 thirds of g, absorb the minus sign in the second set of brackets, h minus d. Again, the 2 just went up there, hence why it's 2 thirds of g. Multiply this out, 2gh over 9 plus 2 thirds of gh minus 2 thirds of gd, and this is again equal to 0. So we can now simplify this. These two can add together. They both have gh, gh, 2 ninths plus 2 thirds. 2 thirds is the same thing as 6 over 9. 6 plus 2 is 8. So that'll be 8 over 9 gh minus 2 thirds gd, not h, gd. That's 0. Times everything by 9 and cancel out the g's. So times everything by 9, cancel out the g's. The first time is 8h. If you times this by 9, you get 6 minus 6d, that's equal to 0, and then we get, we're trying to work out d, so rearrange this, we get d is equal to 4 over 3 h. So just bring the 6d over to the right, add it, and then divide by 6, 8 over 6 is 4 thirds. And finally for part e, describe what would happen if mu is equal to a half. So looking back at our expression or equation for acceleration, what we had over here, this was for stage one, that's for stage one, that is for when a is traveling a distance of h towards the right, that's before b has hit the ground, so as it's falling, acceleration is equal to this. If mu is equal to a half, that means this is a half, one minus two times a half, two times a half is one, one minus one would be zero, acceleration would then be zero. Or in other words, A wouldn't move, and B wouldn't move. The whole system would remain at rest. If there's no acceleration, there won't be a change in speed. So that corresponds to the scenario where A is in limiting equilibrium. It's on the point of sliding. If the friction were any less, or if B were any more massive, if there was more pulling force, then A would slide towards the right. But that's not the case, it's in limiting equilibrium, it remains stationary. We can also see that in terms of the forces that we have in this diagram. So we can see that from the acceleration, but looking at the forces, the backwards frictional force is 2 mu mg. Mu is equal to a half. 2 times a half is 1. Backwards frictional force is then mg. So that's the backwards force that's stopping this whole system from sliding. The force that's trying to make it slide is the mg that we have here. This is the pulling force that's trying to make the whole system slide along. If the backwards frictional force is equal to mg, those two cancel each other out. 
but the frictional force is the max that it can possibly be, so it's in limiting equilibrium. So A and B remain stationary as A is in limiting equilibrium.